Hi everyone. So this is part two of the animal viruses lecture. So we finished bacteriophages in part one and now we're going to talk about animal viruses. Animal viruses are any viruses that infect animals and they're causes of many, many diseases that range from mild everyday diseases to very tough fatal diseases. And understanding animal viruses and their replication cycle is very important, like I said with the part one of this lecture, so that we can create antiviral drugs, we can create vaccines, and just to state some common animal viruses, adenoviruses, which are the cause of many common colds. So common colds are caused by many different viruses. We're going to learn all about this during infection. And adenovirus can also cause pink eye. That's why a lot of times when you get pink eye, so pink eye can be caused by bacteria or viruses. It's not it's very often caused by bacteria. A lot of times it's viruses, so that's why you just let your immune system fight it off. And then HIV, which causes AIDS. Um, herpes virus, which can cause cold sores and sores on genital areas. And then here's the human influenza virus. So we're going to talk about these. So animal viruses are either DNA viruses or RNA viruses. And remember with bacteriophages, they contain DNA in them. With animal viruses, some of our viruses that infect us have DNA. Some of them, their genetic material, their nucleic acid is RNA. Some common diseases caused by DNA viruses are hepatitis. So anything that ends in itis means inflammation. Hepa means liver. So hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. There's different types of hepatitis viruses. So for example, hepatitis A, B, C, D, they all cause inflammation of the liver, but they can have very different outcomes. And we'll learn about those later. Chicken pox is also caused by a DNA virus. Different herpes infections are also DNA viruses. RNA viruses are like influenza, different coronaviruses, measles, mumps, AIDS, polio. These are all RNA viruses. And remember, I want everyone to leave this class knowing that a virus consists of either DNA or RNA surrounded by a capsid, and they can additionally have an envelope and then the spikes, which are the little projections. So the replication of animal viruses, we talked about bacteriophages. Now we're going to talk about what happens in your cells. So let's think of the animal being you, so humans. So with DNA viruses, their replication cycle is first the virus has to attach in, onto your host membrane. So you have your cell. Remember, our cells have cell membranes. So the virus has to attach to your cells. And viruses are very specific to the cells they attach to. So for example, hepatitis virus is typically attached to um, liver cells. Uh, HIV viruses attach to white blood cells. So the virus actually first has to attach to its host cell and they can attach using their viral spikes, the capsid, the protein coat, or their envelope. And then they actually have to enter, which is penetration. So they can either fuse. So if the virus is enveloped, it can fuse with your own cell membrane. That's fusion. Endocytosis is when your cell does cell eating. So it takes on the virus. So attachment, then penetration. So here is the virus attaching, and then it penetrates. Then something has to happen called uncoding. Uncoding means the, remember, the protein coat, the capsid has to come off then the genetic material is let off. So in this section, we're talking about DNA viruses. So the DNA is released. And then with DNA, you can do replication of the DNA. You can do transcription translation to make protein particles. So for the protein to make itself, synthesis of the protein, you get viral DNA replication. Um, and replication happens by DNA polymerase. Remember, we learned about this. So viruses can have their own DNA polymerase, DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, or that's encoded in their own DNA, or they can use yours. And then transcription and translation also happens on the virus's DNA. Then we get the virus to assemble after it's made, it's abused your enzymes and ribosomes and everything. So then it assembles. And then finally, after assembly, you have the virus getting released. And we're going to talk about how it gets released from your cells. So this is a DNA virus. With an RNA virus, it's basically the same steps, but you release RNA instead. So the RNA virus attaches 
and then it penetrates or fuses so it enters then you uncoat you remove the capsid and you have the little viral rna inside your cells then viral rna so we didn't really learn about in our cells we didn't talk about rna replication so rna viruses encode their own rna dependent rna polymerase enzyme that's also called replicase and this is important for them to make copies of their rna and this replicase is going to be very important because for example we're going to learn about the novel coronavirus that's infecting people right now that's causing this pandemic has a replicase and if we can target that replicase using drugs um just using different mechanisms and you can stop the virus from replicating its rna this can be very important in stopping the infection and then the RNA also gets translated. Remember, there's no need for transcription here because you already have the RNA. The virus assembles and it's released. So this is DNA virus, RNA virus. Um, so the virus attaches using its spikes, using its capsid, using its envelope if it has one. It penetrates, it releases its DNA or RNA by uncoding capsid gets removed and then if it's dna you have dna replication and you have transcription and translation if it's an rna virus you can get rna replication by the virus's own enzyme and you also have translation then once the protein is or yes then once you have the mrnas the virus will abuse your own ribosomes to make its protein and then remember proteins get put together and fixed and all of that using your er your golgi apparatus and the virus gets made and it gets released and it's important to understand this replication cycle so again we can use tar drugs to target different things so can we stop viruses from getting in can we stop them from replicating can we stop them from leaving so these are all things that scientists and researchers think about so again, just to set this in stone, I want everyone to leave the class knowing how animal viruses replicate. The virus attaches to its host cell. So here's an example of a virus. It's a DNA virus and it's a, here's the capsid. So it attaches to the host cell and then it enters the host cell and it uncoats, meaning the capsid is removed. Here's the viral DNA. The viral DNA is transcribed into mRNA. And remember the mRNA leaves the nucleus. It's translated to viral protein. So the mRNA codes for making capsid, making all the things that make the virus then the virus matures or gets put together and then the virus is released to go and infect hundreds and hundreds of cells so this is the animal virus life cycle and again this is what scientists are looking at every single day and trying to understand more with coronavirus to see how can we stop this whole cycle of infection Here's this good video. A virus is an intracellular parasite that can reproduce only by taking over a host cell. A virus consists of a nucleic acid genome enclosed in a protein shell called a capsid. In the virus shown here, the genome consists of DNA, but some viruses have RNA. Some viruses are also covered by a membranous envelope that is derived from the membrane of the host cell. There is usually a lock and key fit between the proteins of the capsid and receptors on a particular type of host cell. The virus attaches to a host cell and viral DNA enters the cell. The viral DNA uses nucleotides and enzymes of the host cell to replicate itself. The viral DNA then commandeers other host cell materials and machinery to transcribe its genes into messenger RNA and translate the RNA message into capsid proteins. Viral DNA and capsid proteins then assemble into new viruses. This is maturation. Mature viruses leave the host cell, often destroying the cell in the process. The viruses can go on to infect other cells, spreading the viral infection. So a lot of times when viruses leave your cells, they can leave by just budding, but sometimes they actually destroy our cells. And a lot of times this is why we have sore throats and different annoying symptoms we have from cold viruses. It's this killing of so many cells and inflammation that your immune system is triggering that's causing all that pain. By the way, this is completely random fact, but when this guy in the video said lock and key, there is a show on Netflix that I just started watching called lock and key. This is the fun nerdy science things that I think about while watching these. 
Okay, so entry and penetration. So I'm going to just uh, give a little bit more detail on that. So the virus, to, to cause any infection, a virus actually has to enter your cells. And it can enter in one of two cells. It can either fuse. So if you have an envelope, virus, not a naked virus, like the coronavirus, it has an envelope that's made of a lipid bilayer. Your cells have a lipid bilayer. Because of that, you can have fusion where the plasma membranes just come together. So here's a picture of fusion. Here you have an enveloped virus. It gets fused so the membranes see each other as cells that are similar. And then you get the virus uh, released inside, the capsid gets removed, and then you have the nucleic acid, whether it's RNA or DNA. The virus can also enter by endocytosis. So naked viruses can only enter by endocytosis. Endocytosis is when your cells does this cell eating. It rearranges the whole cell membrane to eat things. So here it is, here's a naked virus and it's going in by cell eating. Your cells do endocytosis for various reasons. And then again, once the virus is in, it uncoats, the capsid is removed, and then the nucleic acid is out. So fusion, Enveloped viruses can get in, they can enter or penetrate our cells by fusion or endocytosis, so they can get in in two ways. Naked viruses can only get in through endocytosis. Release, once the virus is in and the nucleic acid is out and you've done replication, transcription, translation, whatever, depending on whether it's a DNA virus or an RNA virus, and you've made the virus in your cells, um, the virus needs to be released. That's the whole goal of the virus is to get released and infect more cells. So the virus can get released in one of two ways. Lysis. So the virus can actually cause your cells to lyse or die or it can bud. So envelope viruses sometimes will bud out and this is how they gain an envelope. So this is how they evolve to gain an envelope one way. And here are different images of viruses. So here's viruses leaving cells. They're very cool transmission electron microscopy, real images of how the virus leaves. And with both entry and release, if you can create a drug tar uh, target to stop this process, you can hopefully um, either stop or limit the infection. So envelope is gained during release, capsid drops itself in the host cell membrane and pinches off and now you have an enveloped virus. So we're going to specifically focus now on learning about HIV and coronavirus. I'm going to start with HIV. The reason why it's very important to learn about HIV besides its prevalence in the world is it's a very good virus to study virus replication cycles, how far we've come with treatment, um, what viruses look like, what they've evolved to have. So we're going to start by the human immunodeficiency virus. And by the way, nursing tests, medical school tests, all these tests love um, asking stuff about HIV. So HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus because it causes a deficiency in your immune system and it infects and eventually kills several white blood cells. White blood cells are basically your immune system. Without white blood cells, you do not have an immune system. They're the cells that are in you right now that are protecting you against all pathogens. And this virus eventually causes AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. When you first have HIV, it does not necessarily mean that you have AIDS. It's just losing so much white blood cells over time that will cause you to develop AIDS. And I want everyone to leave this class knowing HIV is a virus, AIDS is a disease. So the virus itself is HIV, the disease is AIDS. And HIV, when we look at it, it's an RNA virus. So here's a good picture of HIV. There's a lot of different pictures. And it's what we call a retrovirus. A retrovirus is an RNA virus that can, that has a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which allows it to convert its RNA to DNA. And this is going to become very important. So all retroviruses have reverse transcriptase. When you look at HIV, it's an RNA virus. So here's the RNA and it has the enzyme has the material in it that codes for the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase does reverse transcription. Remember, regular transcription was DNA to RNA. Reverse transcription is RNA to DNA. Now, this is really good for the virus. It's not great for us because if the virus can convert its RNA to DNA, it can take that DNA 
and integrate it into our own DNA and keep getting copies made of the virus. So this is what we call a retrovirus because it has reverse transcriptase. And in this image here, you guys see a white blood cell getting infected by HIV. So they infect white blood cells and they cause white blood cells to die over time. And here's the HIV virus, here's the RNA, here's the capsid, the protein coat. HIV is an enveloped virus, here's the lipid membrane. And these right here are spikes. If you guys remember from the part one, spikes help the virus actually attach to your cells and they're made up of glycoproteins. This is why sometimes you'll see spikes be labeled GP120 or GP41 and the numbers stand for the different chemicals in it. Mm. So retroviruses have a unique RNA replication cycle. They have reverse transcriptase. When you look at them, they in their genome, they code for the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which can convert RNA to DNA. And if you can do that, you can the virus can integrate its DNA into the host genome. And when it does that, we call it a provirus, similar to prophage with bacteriophages. So here's a, I'm gonna try to simplify this as much as I can. So HIV infects white blood cells. It does not infect lung cells. It does not infect skin cells. It infects white blood cells. And I don't care that you guys specifically right now know that they're CD4 cells or T cells. We'll learn about them in the immune system, but this is what these specific white blood cells are called. So the virus first has to infect. So it attaches to your white blood cells using its spikes. So here are the spikes and your white blood cells, your CD4 specific type of white blood cell has receptors on it. These spikes will attach to the cell receptor and once they do fusion will happen. So entry of the virus genetic material. Then you have the capsid which houses the RNA, the virus's DNA, and reverse transcriptase. So you have encoding. So the virus components are released, reverse transcriptase and other enzymes and the RNA. The HIV RNA is converted to HIV DNA using reverse transcriptase. So the RNA is released and then reverse transcriptase will convert it to DNA. The DNA will go inside your nucleus because remember our nucleus houses our DNA and the viral DNA will get incorporated into your own DNA. This is why HIV can be passed down to the, um, can be passed down to generations. So HIV DNA integrates in host genome as provirus, and then you get a lot of replication because remember in the nucleus you have DNA replication, you can get transcription, translation, and you get more assembly of the HIV virus once you make the components and then the virus gets ready after it's been assembled to leave. It gets released through budding. It can also get released through causing a lot of lysis of white blood cells. That's why people lose their white blood cells which protect you against infection. And here's a good video of it. Understanding the structure and life cycle of HIV, the AIDS virus, is critically important to dealing with the disease. HIV is covered by an envelope derived from a host cell membrane. Glycoproteins studying the envelope recognize and bind to receptor molecules on the host cell. A protein coat surrounds the viral genetic material, which consists of two molecules of single-stranded RNA. The enzyme reverse transcriptase enables the virus to make DNA from an RNA template, a trick for which this group of viruses is named, retroviruses. The RNA molecules of HIV enter a host cell when the virus fuses with the plasma membrane and the coat proteins are removed by enzymes. Reverse transcriptase catalyzes the synthesis of a DNA strand complementary to the viral RNA strand and then a second DNA strand complementary to the first. The double-stranded DNA is incorporated as a provirus into the host cell's chromosomal DNA where it may lie dormant for years. Occasionally, the provirus is transcribed into RNA. This RNA serves as both messenger RNA for the formation of HIV proteins and as genetic material for the next generation of viruses. Protein coats form around viral RNA and reverse transcriptase molecules. Viruses bud from the host cell, acquiring envelopes as they leave. 
and they go on to infect a lot more white blood cells. So the virus is taking advantage of everything we have in our own cells. And you can imagine with this whole cycle, you can think as a scientist, okay, what do I do to um, interrupt this cycle to create a drug for HIV? I mean, until today, we don't have proper, complete treatment to cure HIV. We don't have a cure. And the reason why we don't have a cure is because we, when you, a lot of times you guys have heard HIV has a high mutation rate. Mutation means that you have a change in DNA. Remember we learned this, you have a change in the nucleotide sequence. So what happens with reverse transcriptase is the first step that happens when HIV enters your cells, it releases its RNA. It's an RNA virus. And then reverse transcriptase will reverse transcribe the RNA to DNA. So it will make DNA from the RNA. Reverse transcription, uh, reverse transcriptase does a lot of mistakes. So for example, when it sees C, it's supposed to add a G but maybe it'll, instead of adding a G, it adds A. Remember with the binding? So reverse transcriptase makes a lot of mistakes. That's why HIV has a high mutation rate. So it's changing a lot that it's hard to create a drug target. Another reason why it's hard to create a vaccine or drug target is because a lot of the components are similar to our own cells. So how do you target the virus without targeting the um, host cell? So people who are infected with HIV take a drug cocktail that contains many different drugs. That's what a drug cocktail is. So for example, um, one of the first medications that was created for HIV is something that would inhibit reverse transcriptase because if you inhibit reverse transcription, you don't get DNA. And if you don't get DNA, there is no integration into your own genome. And then there's other inhibitors. There's inhibitors that will inhibit enzymes that stop the DNA from being integrated into your own DNA. There's no cure for AIDS yet, but its progression can be really slowed down by medication, which unfortunately is extremely expensive. And if you guys take an ethics and science class, later in your career, you'll learn about um, these drugs and companies, and especially with the drug cocktail for HIV patients, why it's extremely expensive. Now, as all of you guys know, usually when we have famous rich people and they get HIV, they end up living a relatively healthy life because they can afford these very expensive drug cocktails that you have to take for life. One of a very popular drug that's in this drug cocktail is AZT. AZT is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor and it mimics the structure of thymine. So if you look at what thymine looks like in AZT, so when you give a patient who has HIV AZT, AZT will stop um, hopefully stop RNA from being converted to DNA, the virus's DNA because it looks like thymine and we call that a base analog. So that was HIV. Now we're going to talk about coronaviruses. I think it's very relevant seeing what's going on. So coronaviruses are a huge family of viruses, and they're viruses that infect both animals and humans. We see a lot of viruses, um, a lot of coronaviruses in the animal world, specifically in bats, but a lot of other animals as well, pigs, um, birds. So coronaviruses cause respiratory infections, unlike HIV, which causes a blood infection. They cause respiratory infections. And when we look at common colds seasonally, common colds are caused by many, uh, many viruses, such as like rhinovirus, adenovirus, a lot of different viruses. But coronaviruses cause about 10 to 15% of common cold cases, which many of us have had. And the symptoms range from mild to moderate respiratory infections, like cough, sore throats. They're pretty mild to moderate. But recently, we've seen severe cases with new strain, SARS, MERS, COVID-19. We're going to talk about COVID-19. This is the disease, not the virus. I'll talk about it in a second. So again, the coronaviruses will infect. Coronaviruses infect respiratory tract cells. So um, cells here, cells in your lungs. This is the upper respiratory tract. This is lower respiratory tracts when you get down to your lungs. So they'll infect those cells, potentially cause the cells to die, go on and infect more cells. And this is what the coronavirus looks like. We will talk about the structure in a second. And again, they, ca they cause these respiratory infections and they're also transmitted by people sneezing and coughing. So they're cold viruses. But I, so I talked about them being 
relatively common and causing mild symptoms, but recently we've seen outbreaks of very severe respiratory illnesses caused by novel coronaviruses. And examples of these are SARS and MERS. SARS is severe acute respiratory syndrome and MERS is the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome. And they, they've happened in the last 10 years and they've caused major outbreaks in the world. These strains are a little bit distinct from the common human coronaviruses that we were seeing. So they originated in bats and were transmitted to animals by close contact or feed. So they originate in bats and usually when you have coronaviruses in animals which we see many they don't easily jump to animals because to jump to an animal you actually need to be able to bind an animal cell and get in you have to be able to somehow get in so the receptors are on our cells could be a little different than animal cells but these strains were able to jump and get in and they have, once they made it to humans from animals, they, very, they have a very high human to human transmission rate, which we'd say in normal terms, we say they're highly contagious. But as science students, what you guys would say is they have a high human to human transmission rate. And they typically produce mild symptoms, but for some people there are severe symptoms and you could even get death from lung damage and other, compli uh, other complicated issues. So here are different bats that could harbor coronaviruses and they could transfer it to an intermediate host. An intermediate host could be like a snake or a cat and then the human could get it from that animal either by close contact with those animals or by feed and then again they infect respiratory cells and when they do cause severe symptoms it's because they damage some parts of the lung such as the alveoli and those of you who've taken anatomy know what that is they're the little air sacs in the lungs they cause so much inflammation that it becomes hard to breathe and you could get pneumonia so now we're gonna talk about the novel coronavirus strain that causes COVID-19. In December 2019, there was a distinct coronavirus found to be responsible for a pneumonia outbreak in China. So China was having this major outbreak of very severe cold cases and pneumonia. And the disease was called coronavirus disease 2019, that's the disease. And it was caused by a coronavirus that we now call SARS-CoV-2. I want everyone to leave the class knowing that COVID-19 is a disease and SARS-CoV-2 is a virus. COVID-19 is not the virus, it's the disease. So the virus, the novel coronavirus, they changed the names um, from calling it novel coronavirus, but now we call it SARS coronavirus 2. The reason why we called the virus that causes COVID-19 disease SARS coronavirus 2 is when you sequenced its RNA sequence, it was very similar to the coronavirus that caused the SARS epidemic years ago. So it's SARS 2, it's similar to that one, and it's a coronavirus strain. And SARS stood for severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is what it causes. And it's a novel coronavirus because it recently jumped from animal to human, and we think it jumped from bats as the main reservoir. The reason why we came up with that is that when you sequence the RNA, so for example, if you have a patient and they have the COVID-19, so the disease, um, and you take the virus and you sequence its RNA because it's an RNA virus, they saw that that sequence had very high similarity to the coronavirus that was sequenced from a bat. Um, I think it was 85 or 90% uh, similarity to them, so that's why we know. And here is a picture from the NIH, the National Institute of Health. It's a transmission electron microscope image. So showing the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, leaving a US patient um, leaving cultured cells from a patient. So whenever you grow it in lab, you grow viruses in cultured cells because you cannot grow viruses on their own. Remember, they need a host to survive. And here are the spikes. So to give it a better idea of um, how it infects and how it leaves. 
So uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus, has a very high similarity to coronavirus um, from bats. And when we look at the structure, I want everyone to know the structure of SARS coronavirus 2, since we spent this whole lecture talking about virus structure. And when you know the stru when you know the structure and you know the replication, you can become a really great scientist to create drug targets and vaccines. When we look at the coronavirus, the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, meaning it has RNA as its nucleic acid. It has a capsid. It's an enveloped virus, so it has an envelope, and it has spikes that help the virus attach and enter our cells. So we call the RNA and capsid, the nucleocapsid, so this is what makes it. And then there's the membrane protein, which determines the shape of the viral envelope, and the envelope protein, which helps the virus assemble and release and helps in causing more disease. So this is the virus structure right here. And the more that we understand about the specific spikes that SARS-CoV-2 uses to get into our cells, the better prepared we are to create drugs. And when we studied this further, when scientists did, they saw that SARS-CoV-2, the virus, it enters cells or binds to cells through receptors that are found on our lung cells, our kidney cells, and our gastrointestinal tract, but mainly lung cells. So when you look at lung cells, our cells in your lungs have these receptors. Receptors are little proteins on the cell membrane, and we call them the ACE2 receptors, and these receptors are important for a lot of things. You'll learn about it if you take um, advanced cell and molecular biology classes. But your lung cells have these ACE2 receptors, and this is what SARS-CoV-2 their spikes attached to so that they can get in your cells and release their DNA and cause infection. And ACE2, again, is a receptor that we see on lung cells, kidney cells, and different areas of your gastrointestinal tract. I read this paper and these scientists saw that if they create antibodies that can inhibit this whole spike to ACE2 binding, then they can stop entry of the SARS-CoV-2 into your cells and potentially stop infection. So here's the very simplified life cycle of SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. So here's the virus. In order to attach and enter your cells, the spikes on SARS-CoV-2 will bind to the ACE2 receptor on lung cells. And then the virus will fuse because it's an enveloped virus with your own cells that also have a cell membrane. Fusion will happen. Remember, it's an RNA virus, so then the capsid gets removed and you have the genomic RNA. Then the RNA is, can be replicated using the virus's own replicase enzyme, which is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It can also be translated in, and um, translated into protein, so then you make the SARS-CoV-2 protein, you make capsid protein, you make all the enzymes it needs, and then the virus is put together and it can leave through exocytosis or it can leave cells through budding. So this is the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. And as a scientist, you look at this whole life cycle and you think, okay, what parts of this can I stop so that I can create a drug? If you stop entry, that's a great thing. Um, this could be more of a preventative mes me um, medicine, maybe. Because if you think about it, if people already have an infection, you want to give it to them early on because if cells are already infected, then this is then it may not be that helpful. You can stop this process here. You can create drugs that target uh, maybe replicase, which is RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, different parts to this here replication. You can create drugs that stop the virus from assembling. You can create drugs that stop the virus from getting released. But the main thing is you want to create a drug that is effective and that um, does not harm our own cells, our own host cells. I thought this, this is a very um, information heavy picture that I got from a paper, but I think it's a good to summarize things. So again, if we look at SARS-CoV-2, they originated from coronaviruses from bats that are very similar to what caused SARS years ago. And this could have jumped an intermediate host to, to a bat, to swine, a civet, a mouse. 
And so this is the intermediate host. So it could have gone back straight to human or back to intermediate host to human. When we look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it has spikes and these spikes specifically attach to the ACE2 receptor that we see on different cells such as lung cells. It's an enveloped virus and it's an RNA virus and the virus is can cause disease in many people that ranges from zero symptoms to mild to moderate to very severe. Individuals who are most susceptible to severe disease are elderly people who are around 65 and older and people with underlying diseases. We've seen it be very um, fatal for people who have different heart, heart problems. So hypertension as well as diabetes and asthma. So it is very, very serious for people who are in this group, but it can affect anyone and it can infect people and cause various degrees of disease. In terms of treatment, antiviral drugs try to stop the virus from entering or replicating or being released. We're currently testing antiviral drugs that were, pre that were or are used with influenza. So we have actually drugs for influenza. They're not that common. We'll learn about that later. Uh, drugs that were used with the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, drugs that were used with SARS to see if they help with COVID-19. And we did see that they did help, especially the influenza drugs. Vaccines work. We haven't learned about vaccines yet, but they work by create, causing the human body to create antibodies to defend against the virus if you're ever exposed to it. As of now, right now, we don't have an available vaccine for COVID-19. So things that I read online, scientists are looking at old vaccines that they were creating during the SARS pandemic years ago. The US right now has an mRNA-based vaccine in child. mRNA-based vaccine means that they took the mRNA from the virus and they saw if it can trigger an immune response in humans. And if it can, they take that mRNA and they create a vaccine out of it. And so you get a shot of the virus's mRNA and hopefully your virus is ready to attack, um, your body's ready to attack the virus if it ever sees it. Companies are also working on protein subunit vaccines. Can you create vaccines from the spikes or the capsid? China's working on an inactivated virus vaccines, and you'll know what these mean when we talk about the immune system. And another idea is if we have people who are infected, can we give them antibodies from people who've already overcome the disease? Because remember, a lot of people who have had the disease have been infected and made it a lot, made it through. So you can take antibodies from patients who've recovered and give it to sick patients, and hopefully that should buy you some time. And this was done with Ebola patients. <laughs> So this was SARS-CoV-2. The main thing I want everyone to know to take from this class is SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that causes COVID-19 and to have some idea of what the virus looks like, how it gets into cells, what receptors it's using, especially that you guys are reading more um, elaborate, I'm hoping, science studies on COVID-19. So to start kind of putting all our virus lecture together, we're gonna to talk about the outcomes of viral infection. So we talked about different animal viruses. Now we're gonna say, well, what happens when someone gets infected with a virus, whether that's HIV or influenza or coronavirus? You can get different outcomes. So the virus can cause an acute infection. We're gonna learn about what all of these are. It can cause a chronic or persistent infection. We're gonna say that these terms are interchangeable. It can cause a latent infection. And in some cases, some viruses can cause cancer. So they can cause your own cells to transform to cancer cells. With acute infections, you have a sudden onset of symptoms very quickly, very early. And then, um, then you don't have that infection anymore. With chronic or persistent infection, you have the infection for long periods of time. And then with latent infection, it comes and goes. So we're gonna talk about the specifics of each one in a second. So we'll start. And all of these infections, acute infections, chronic and latent, start with an acute phase where you start with an infection. The infection can go away, it can persist, or it can come and go. With an acute infection, you have a high virus in the beginning of an infection, 
for a short period of time. So you have symptoms come on all of a sudden. So it's a rapid onset of infection symptoms. So an example of this is you're next to someone, they have a bad cold and they sneeze on you and a day later you start sneezing. That's an acute infection. You rapidly got uh, um, symptoms and you rapidly, your, bo your body unfortunately has a high amount of virus that's going on infecting cells until your immune system kicks in. So it's a short duration of symptoms. When we think of colds, they last a few days, a week, two weeks. That's relatively short. You can have long lasting immunity. So if you're exposed to one flu strain or one cold strain, if you're exposed to it again, hopefully your body build anti built antibodies so you don't get uh, sick again if you see it. Symptoms are host cell death. So a lot of viruses that cause acute infection cause your own cells to die. And um, we'll learn about this with the immune system. So apoptosis, why that happens. And examples of acute infections are influenza colds, where we see rapid onset of symptoms and then you're fine. So this is acute infections. Chronic infections or persistent infections are continuous infections, infections, but you have low numbers of the virus. And if someone has a chronic or a persistent infection, you can detect the virus in them at all times. So they haven't really recovered from the viral infection. And they may or may not have the disease in the chronic phase, but there is still shedding viruses. So they're still carriers and a lot of chronic or persistent infections are fatal, meaning they're very bad. So examples of chronic infections are hepatitis B and C and HIV viruses. So when we think of HIV, when someone, um, okay, someone, if God forbid you get HIV today, you're not going to see symptoms tomorrow. You're not going to see symptoms in a week. You're not going to see symptoms in two weeks. It's not like a cold or a flu where you see symptoms right away. It's gonna take a month for someone to see symptoms. That's why it's a chronic or persistent infection. And then the infection just stays. So you have a certain amount of HIV virus in you that slowly starts going high. Same thing with hepatitis B and C, and these viruses cause bad inflammation of the liver and they ultimately can end up damaging your liver. So that's a chronic infection. Latent infections are infections where the virus comes and goes, causes symptoms back and forth. So the virus, you'll have the virus and it'll lay dormant, meaning you won't see symptoms in your cells until some stress triggers the virus production. So examples of viruses that cause latent infections are different human herpes viruses. So human herpes virus one, causes a human herpes virus one and human herpes virus two cause different types of diseases. So one of them causes cold sores on your mouth and one of them causes genital herpes. And with these ones, think of someone who has a cold sore. A cold sore is caused by the herpes simplex virus one. And with this virus, once you have cold sores, you basically have them for life. They come and go. And if you talk to most people who get them, they'll tell you that they get them when they're stressed, they get them when they're immunocompromised, if they're sick. So you'll always have the virus, but something will trigger the symptoms to come. This is why we see this pattern of symptoms. The virus lays low. Then you have another, um, I guess, outbreak of the virus, then you, it, it lays low. Another one is the chicken pox virus, the chicken pox and shingles. So once you have the chicken pox virus, you have it in your system and something can trigger it to eventually also cause shingles, which is this very, very, very painful rash, if I were to describe it on your body. Epstein-Barr virus is also caused by the human herpes virus 4, and this causes mononucleosis, which um, people unfortunately call the kissing disease because you could get it from saliva. It's, it's um, transmitted oral-oral. So again, with the latent infection, let's talk about this. After the initial infection, the virus is not detected unless something reactivates the disease. And the virus usually sits in your nerve cells or immune cells, and it can be, decre it can be triggered by a decreased immune system. Stress causes a decreased immune system. That's why people typically get very sick when they're stressed. Reactivation symptoms can be similar or different to previous symptoms. So oral or genital herpes simplex sores have periodic outbreaks. They come and go. 
uh, people who've had chicken pox can get shingles. 30% um, of those people can, may or may not have shingles, which again is this bad rash right here. So if the initial infection causes cold sores in children, if we think of the herpes virus, and then the, the virus moves along to nerve cells where it becomes latent, and then something will trigger that virus to reactivate again, such as stress, which lowers your immune system. And then the person has the virus again. Same thing from going from having chicken pox where you have the virus in you to it eventually, maybe years down the road, you get shingles. So that's a latent infection. And then finally, some viruses, unfortunately, can cause your cells to transform into cancer cells. I'm going to start out with what cancer cells mean. So cancer cells, at the most basic definition, are cells that never stop dividing. So they divide and divide and divide. And that's what a tumor is. A tumor is a cell mass, cells that just keep dividing and dividing till you get a tumor. Viruses that can infect your cell and cause that virus, that sorry, that cell to continue to divide are viruses that can potentially cause cancer. So any virus that can integrate its nucleic acid into the host genome as a provirus and activate cell division into your own cells can cause cancer. Examples of viruses that can potentially transform your cells into cancer cells are hepatitis B and C viruses. This is why they're pretty bad. So they can cause liver cancer. The human papillomavirus or HPV virus, which we have a vaccine for, can cause different types of cancers, throat cancer, cervical cancer. Is, it can be common with the HPV virus. The EBV virus, um, the Epstein-Barr virus can cause cancers of the immune system, which we call lymphoma. So there's many different viruses that can transform your cells into cancer cells. And again, the virus, the virus's genetic material will get integrated into your own genetic material, causing your cells to divide and divide and divide. And then eventually you have, uh, unfortunately, a tumor or a mass. Two more slides. So we're done with animal viruses. I have one slide on plant viruses. We started this whole lecture in part one saying that viruses can infect all life. Another air organism that viruses can infect are plant cells, and they can cause a lot of major issues. They can stunt plant growth, they can decrease crop yield, they can cause discoloration, tumors in plants, even death. Even if you're not into agriculture, this affects every single one of us. If crops it mainly affects farmers, but this transitions to all of us. So if you have a field that's feeding a community and it gets infected with viruses, it's a terrible thing because you have to kill those crops. You have to get rid of them. And also it causes the price of your fruits and vegetables to go up. So they're similar to other viruses and they can be spread through contaminated soil, seeds, pollen, plant tissue. Vectors can spread plant viruses. Vector is a thing that spreads the virus from one thing to another. So insects, humans, worms, if you have an insect, it can trans, uh, transfer the virus from one plant to another plant. And a common virus is the tobacco mosaic virus that infects tobacco and related plants. And this is what it looks like. I think a lot of you guys, when you walk on campus, you see this. this typically, these plants have been infected with viruses. There is no cure for most viral plant diseases. You just have to get rid of the plants. So scientists who go into agriculture focus on preventing infection or um, breeding genetically modified crops that resist getting infected by viruses. Finally, we're going to end the virus lecture by talking about prions, which have nothing to do with viruses. They just fit in nicely with this lecture, and I want you guys to learn it. So uh, prions are infectious agents. They're not cells. They're not viruses. They're misfolded proteins that can cause very bad infections. And the name prion comes from proteinaceous infectious particles. They're misfolded proteins, and they can cause fatal deadly diseases. So a lot of you guys want to go into the health field. You may see a patient who has this. This is a very bad thing and it is an area of research for scientists. They're thought to be a misfolded form of protein that's normally present in your brain cells. And this misfolded protein is transmissible to other prion proteins. So once you have the prion, it'll start 
causing other proteins in your brain to misfold, which is a very, very bad thing. And it causes fatal brain diseases. So fatal uh, nerve system diseases. And we're going to talk about the protein that's involved in this and we'll get to this prion disease. Okay, so, so they're misfolded protein and a prion can cause a normally functioning brain protein to misfold. They don't have nucleic acid and they accumulate in the brain by converting PRPC to PRPSC. And these PRPSC, the SC stands for scrapies, are proteins that are less susceptible to proteases that you have. And therefore you get aggregates in the brain, which you can imagine is a, not a good thing at all. So the normal cellular prion protein on cell surfaces is the PRPC. The one that is the prion or the misfolded one is the PRPSC, the scrapey protein, and it accumulates in brain cells and forms plaques, which are basically holes. And when we look at the PRPSC and PRPC, both, both of these proteins have the same amino acid sequence, but one is misfolded and it can lead to very bad outcomes. This is why on the first day of class, we said that protein folding is very important to get proper function. So here is how you get prion replication. When you, so PRPC, which is a normal protein that we find is created by cells and secreted to the cell surface. So here you have the PRP protein created and it's secreted to the cell surface. The PRPSC can be acquired, let's say, this sounds really bad, but let's say you eat brain, some people eat brain, and it's contaminated with prions or PRPSC, and you get that, it can be acquired. And this PRPSC, the bad version, will react with the cell surface of the good one and convert the good protein to the misfolded bad protein. And now what happens is you get accumulation of this protein and you get aggregates, which eventually lead to various bad brain diseases. So uh, people still don't know scientists why this protein becomes altered and it destroys your brain, spinal cord, different nervous system tissue, but it creates holes and plaques in brain tissue. This is why I think I told you guys before, but when I took anatomy and I was a student and in anatomy, you do dissections whenever my friend did dissections on brains. She covered herself completely because she was so scared of prions. So it is a good idea. And they're inherited. They're transmissible by ingestion, meaning eating, transplant, surgical instruments. That's why we have to make sure that we sterilize and we clean everything. And Prions cause different brain diseases in not just humans, but animals as well. So sheep scrapies, bovine, bovine spongiform encephaly is also called mad cow disease. We had a major outbreak of this years ago. Some of you may remember. And the unfortunate thing is when you have mad cow disease, you have to kill all the cows because it can get transmitted to humans and it's, it's just a terrible disease. And then Crutzfeldt jacob disease in humans is incurable and can lead to deterioration of the brain. So this was the whole uh, virus lecture. So I hope that you guys learned about viruses, learned about the structure, the characteristics, bacteriophages, animal viruses, plant viruses, prions, and that you guys know something about HIV and coronavirus. And finally, the lecture is done.